Shinpachi narrates the story of how Edo, the land of the samurai, was invaded by strangers, who came from space and brought destruction into their once great nation. Having had enough of these aliens, a selected few rose up to challenge them, the Edo of old. They were the samurai, a team of renowned warriors. After conquering the aliens, Shinpachi further narrates how a new immortal enemy emerged, Utsuro, who was born from the energy of the planet's life force, called Ley Lines. As a result of being immortal, Utsuro developed multiple separate personalities, two of which were Teacher Jintoki, and the founder of the Shoka Sanjuka school, Shoyo Yoshida. Tired of immortality, Utsuro waged a war against the known universe, with a goal to destroy the entire planet and himself, but the people of Edo resisted him. At the end of the battle, the odd jobs and their allies forced Utsuro to fall into the Ley Lines. Now having used up all his energy to contain the Ley Lines, the dog deity, Sadaharu, entered a long coma. Later on, the members of Odd Jobs found their respective goals and set off on different paths. After two years, Kagaru looked for a way to return Sadaharu to normal, while he, Shinpachi, remained in Edo. Meanwhile, Jintoki, having foreseen Utsuro's return made the rounds in various scattered areas from which the Ley Lines erupt. Utsuro's genes continued to survive deep underground within the Ley Lines. According to Shinpachi, in over two years, they rebuilt Utsuro's physical form, and he was reborn at a remote ley line. Jintoki wandered the lands with Utsuro, who grew rapidly. One day it became clear that the body housed a personality that could be Shoyo. However, Utsuro was captured by the Death Star Sect, a dangerous group that was led by the remnants of the Tendashu. To prevent them from gaining a perfect immortal, Utsuro left his heart with Jintoki. In order to complete Utsuro's recovery, and by extension, their own immortality, the sect sets its sights on Earth's ley lines. At the ruins of Shoka Sanjuku, Jintoki is reunited with Takasugi, who has used the bones of a senior student in Oboro to become partially immortal. In order to thwart the sect's plans for immortality, Jintoki and Takasugi head for Edo. Upon returning to Edo, Jintoki spots the older Shinpachi and Kagura, but makes no contact with them. Meanwhile, Katsura, the first prime minister, uses his office to investigate the sect's actions. In order to draw out the sect, Takasugi blows up the terminal and attempts to assassinate Katsura, but Katsura smartly uses the assassination as cover to relinquish his position as Prime Minister. The pupils of Shoka Sanjuku school once again come together. Even the Shinsengimi, who were pretending to have disbanded, regrouped. After much ado, the ship carrying Kondo attacks the sect's mobile cathedral queue, causing the wreckage to fall atop the terminal. Kondo reunites with the Shinsengimi. However, the sect occupies the terminal, and the city is plunged into danger, as Edo is once again faced with harm. This is when Shinpachi, Kagura, and the residents of Kabuki district face off in front of odd jobs and set off to battle. To fulfill their wishes and save their teacher, Jintoki, Takasugi, and Katsura decide to rescue Utsuro. After Shinpachi's narration, Jintoki and his companions arrive at the terminal. Takasugi declares that he's grateful that they have come this far on their own and promises they'll take back everything by their own power. They go into the terminal. On a beautiful summer day, a young Jintoki runs late to school. He's joined by a young Takasugi and Kagura, who are equally late. While in class, the pupils paint and laugh, as the teacher, Shoyo, stings a sleeping pupil. When school is over for the day, the pupils all run home, excited. This was their happy childhood. Back to the terminal, Jintoki and his companions throw a bomb into the midst of the Tendashu forces, who have gathered in their numbers, armed and ready. The bomb explodes in their faces, providing cover for Jintoki and his companions to sweep in and slay them, as they hasten to the terminal's core. Getting closer, they come to a stunning realization that though the sex ship is down, it continues to drain energy from the earth through the terminal's core, somehow making the Siriman gate operate, which could bring Utsuro back even without his heart. Katsura tells Jintoki and Takasugi that he's surprised that some people are determined to become immortal, even though the world is awful. He tells them he doesn't mind dying here, as long as he gets to put an end to this. After throwing off another bomb, the steps begin to collapse. Frantic, the companions run quicker, desperate to make it in time, but too late. As they fall off, Takasugi catches Jintoki, whose leg is caught in Katsura's hands, desperate. With a ferocious effort, Takasugi pulls them up. As they run again, Jintoki confesses that he understands why the Tendashu are fighting to be immortal, that even he enjoys the moments he's shared with his companions, from childhood to adulthood, and would love to see his teacher again. Just then, Katsura saves his companions from a missile launched at them. Jintoki hurries to him, worried, as Katsura weakly gets up. Immediately, the Tendashu forces surround them. As the Tendashu forces prepare for an attack, they're blasted from without. 
the Shinsengumi, Hayaka, Anawabanshu, and the rest of the Kabukicho residents attack them, while Matsudaira shoots down the ships outside. The Shinsengumi plan to blow up the mothership on top of the terminal because it has stolen too much energy. The Tendashu alert their leader that they're losing the battle and might be better off retreating and regrouping, but their leader disagrees. He believes leaving will jeopardize their mission and they'd lose the ability to produce the elixir they need for their immortality. And moreover, Utsuro can only survive on Earth's energy. As the Tendashu retreat from their leader, informing him that it's time to withdraw, they start to cough, sick. Their leader tells them they already have Utsuro's genes, and just like him, they begin to transform. Utsuro, prior to his passing, hikes the mountains with Jintoki. They drink tea in a restaurant, quiet and sullen. When Utsuro and Jintoki are attacked on a different mountain, Jintoki takes Utsuro's heart, knowing the enemies are after it, and falls into a river. Back at the terminal, Takasugi asks Jintoki to give him the heart, knowing he's racked with guilt, but Jintoki refuses. As they wait, they're ambushed by the Tendashu forces. Unscathed, Jintoki and his companions hang on the railing of an elevator, cautious. Jintoki tells Takasugi that he's alright, and that he's regained everything he lost by holding on to Utsuro's heart. Suddenly, they're attacked again, and Katsura falls off, along with Utsuro's heart. Takasugi and Jintoki get to safety. But before long, the Tendashu attacks Takasugi from behind. Enraged, Jintoki charges for battle, but he's easily repelled. The Tendashu claim they now have a piece of Utsuro in them and have therefore become strong. Hitsugi, a samurai for the Neraku organization, attacks Kagura, and steals Utsuro's heart from him, intending to reawaken Utsuro himself. Infuriated by this, Kagura attacks him in return, determined to take back the heart. During their fierce battle, Hitsugi stabs Utsuro's heart into the terminal's core and destroys it. Jintoki and Takasugi battle the Tendashu. With neither of them able to prevail, Takasugi offers to be a distraction for the Tendashu, with Jintoki having the opportunity to go closer to the terminal's core. As energy bursts out of the core, one of the Tendashu disintegrates, and Sadaharu emerges. Overwhelmed with excitement, Sadaharu swallows Jintoki. After the happy reunion, Sadaharu vomits Jintoki, who turns out sullen. Jintoki sees Kagura and Shinpachi and asks if they joined in the fight because their shop closed up and they had nothing else to do, but they tell him no, that they joined in the fight against the Tendashu because they want to be with him and everyone else, since they all belong to odd jobs. After helping Jintoki up, they realize he has shrunk in height, as a result of being swallowed up by Sadaharu. Approaching two other men who also emerged out of Sadaharu, Jintoki commands them to remerge with him, being a fractional part of him. As he forces them to emerge, they're attacked again by the Tendashu forces. Then just in time, Sadaharu swallows up Jintoki and the two men, and Jintoki emerges out, whole again, and ready for battle. Takasugi, bloody and drained from the fight, staggers towards the Tendashu ship. With the battle momentarily over, Hiro Madao arrives in a car to rescue Jintoki and the other samurai. Together they head for the ship. After their fight, Hitsugi confesses to Kaguru that he had no initial intentions of reawakening Utsuro. He destroyed the heart because he knows Utsuro lived a painful and lonely life, and he wishes to prevent that from happening again. Being immortal himself, he understands the misery that comes with it. Just then, the regeneration of Utsuro to Shoyo is completed, as he breaks out of the pod. Shoyo seizes the leader of the Tendashu. He asks who brought him back to life and why. When the leader of the Tendashu confesses that he brought him back, and in a bid to impress him tells him he has inherited Utsuro's blood and wants to serve him to contribute to the destruction of the universe, Shoyo is unimpressed by the answer, and eliminates him, saying he has a job to do, which is to put an end to himself and to Utsuro. As Shoyo tries to leave, Takasugi waddles to him, tired and faint. He tells Shoyo to be cheerful about returning to life and vouches to protect him. He suggests they return to the Shoka Sanjuka school, just like old times, that he has so much to tell him. However, Shoyo tells him it's impossible, that he doesn't deserve to be called a teacher anymore, since he failed in his duty to help and protect them. Suddenly, Takasugi stabs Shoyo, revealing that Utsuro's blood has taken over him. He tells him he knows he's weak and so has waited for the right moment to strike him down. As he attacks Shoyo again, the terminal erupts with an explosion. Crawling out of a ruble, Jintoki calls Shinpachi and Kagura, who are nowhere to be found. He arrives outside, shocked to see the destruction of the terminal. When Utsuro, Having taken over Takasugi's body notices Jintoki's presence, he reminds Jintoki about when he rejected him, during their earlier war to destroy the universe. Utsuro further tells him that as long as they're alive, tragedies will continue to occur, and that since he has returned to life, he's back to fulfill his intentions of destroying them. Jintoki, unmoved, agrees with him, 
but says it's Utsuro who must be destroyed instead. Ready for battle, Utsuro attacks Jintoki. During the battle, in an attempt to pacify Utsuro, Jintoki promises him that he will recover everything they lost, but Utsuro is unyielding. He says the promises have already been broken by Takasugi. Jintoki doesn't believe this. He confidently tells Utsuro that Takasugi can't agree to the destruction of the universe. Utsuro begins to bleed profusely, astonished that he isn't healing. When he asks about the body of Shoyo, Jintoki informs him, much to his dismay, that the body was not there. Utsuro comes to the realization that Takasugi didn't attack Shoyo earlier. Instead, supported by Oboro, whose blood also runs through his body, Takasugi stabbed himself. The body that Utsuro saw lying on the ground was himself. Jintoki tells him he lost his immortality the moment he took over Takasugi's body. He assures him he'll put an end to him just as he wishes. Realizing he's been outsmarted, Utsuro tries to play into Jintoki's conscience, about not being able to eliminate him, as eliminating him will also equal eliminating Takasugi. Flashing forward, he attacks Jintoki, but Jintoki is unfazed. He assures him that a piece of Takasugi will always be in him, and with that Utsuro is slain. Jintoki sits Takasugi up. He's weak and on the verge of eternal sleep. Takasugi tells Jintoki that the battle was his last fight with him. He feels bad that he wasn't in control of himself. Jintoki tells him not to worry, that Takasugi's sword took down Utsuro, inadvertently saying that Takasugi was also responsible for Shoyo's safety. Tearful and emotional, Jintoki and Takasugi recall how they fought a lot as kids. Takasugi accuses him of not changing, but Jintoki tells him it's how they are fated to be. Takasugi reminds him about the day he lost his eye, and tells him he's felt guilty every time he looked at him. He confesses that once he's gone, there'll be no more guilt. Takasugi admits he admires Jintoki, and spent his whole life chasing after him. Touched, Jintoki asks Takasugi to wait for him in hell, and Takasugi promises to wait, as he passes away. Shinpachi and Kagura rescue Shoyo. Shoyo asks why they decided to save him, declaring he's responsible for everything happening, but Shinpachi tells him Jintoki taught them to always help someone in need, then jokingly he adds that after helping he can run away with their money. Besides, he's always wanted to meet Jintoki's teacher, to which Shoyo also admits he's anticipated meeting Jintoki's students. He confesses to them that without Jintoki and the other pupils, he would have remained an empty void. However, he sadly admits that his presence only served to shackle them down, and he, therefore, has no right to call himself their teacher. Shinpachi, still trying to pacify Shoyo, tells him they only got to meet Jintoki because of him, and he tells him to thank you, much to Shoyo's delight. When the Shinsengumi announce that they've taken control over the Tendashu mothership, and that the enemies have scattered, they're informed that the terminal is still running out of control, and if it goes down, the energy inside it will explode. They believe it's only a matter of time before it collapses with the ship, so they suggest everyone gets out. Katsura asks what can be done, and just then Shoyo comes up with a solution. He announces that he'll fire all the energy it has mined back down through the terminal, using the energy within him. Then he also adds that it will lead to the complete destruction of the terminal. The Shinsengumi prepare to evacuate the terminal. Shoyo tells Shinpachi and the other samurai to leave the terminal and save themselves. He confesses the irony of hating his immortal life, yet admittedly, time is no more on his side. Just before he leaves, he tells them it's his duty to protect them. Arriving back at the ship, Shoyo encourages himself to stay strong. Just then, Kagura and Shinpachi also join him, showing their support for him. Kagura tells him they can't leave him alone by himself. The Shinsengumi and allied forces destroy the terminal's core, resulting in a terrible explosion. While everyone evacuates the terminal, Katsura stays behind. He reminds Jintoki about how he always covered up for him and Takasugi while they were little, and he can't leave until he cleans up their mess again. As the terminal destroys, Shoyo is repelled back, too weak to fight it. Just before completely losing his footing, Shinpachi and Kagura show up to help him. The terminal demolishes. In his demise, Shoyo expresses his delight for Jintoki, at being able to cherish the people the same he cherished him, for Jintoki and his childhood companions influenced his heart towards humanity. Sometime in the future, Tama wakes up with memories of what has happened, implanted in her by Tamako, her clone. Tama asks where she is, and Tamako tells her she's in Master Gingai's robot warehouse. Tama is woozy, as a result of being unconscious for so long. Tamako informs her that she was damaged in the war, and thereon fell into a lengthy sleep, adding that, as her clone, she has collected all the data for her during her absence. Still unbalanced, Tama asks her how long she's been asleep. As Tama and Tamako walk through their transformed city, which has now become Tokyo, Tama is astonished by the great development. She asks if this is really Edo, 
but Tomako tells her it's called Tokyo now, further adding that after the war, Edo was reborn and entered a period of sustained development. Admittedly, Tama tells her their efforts during the war helped Edo transform into Tokyo. Tama confesses the city is no longer what she remembers. When she asks about the aftermath of the war, Tamako tells her to check for herself, as the information has all been implanted in her. After tapping into her visions, Tama hears Shinpachi's voice, as he wonders how much time would have passed by the time she comes awake and obtains all the data. He assures her that after the war, they made it back. However, he wasn't sure what they fought against, or if they won. But then after returning to Edo and seeing Jintoki slightly smiling again, he realized the significance of the things they regained, as well as the things they lost. In the memory, Shinpachi arrives, looking for Jintoki, but seeing no traces of him he assumes he has left again, only for Jintoki to pop out from underneath the desk. Shocked, Shinpachi screams. He asks Jintoki why he has to sleep underneath the table, while he assumed he'd run off again. Jintoki tells him it's his own house and he can come home whenever he wants. Shinpachi disagrees. He reminds Jintoki that he's now the leader at Odd Jobs, since he held the place together while he was gone. As Shinpachi helps Jintoki up and leads him off to the room, Kagura kicks the door in their faces. She warns them it's rude to walk, unwelcome, into a girl's room, and she's tired of warning them. She claims since she's returned, she has become the new COO and has taken claim to the room. Shinpachi is surprised by Kagura's sudden declaration. He announces himself as the new CEO. Kagura isn't impressed though. She believes CEOs are mere figureheads and lazy good for nothing. She's convinced the real power rests in the hands of strong women like herself and Gariki. Shinpachi counters her. He thinks her definition of strength belongs in other things, and at the same time adds that Gariki was never a COO. As Jintoki sits outside the closet, Shinpachi warns him that it's a no-go area. Abruptly, Sadaharu breaks out of the closet and sucks on Jintoki's head. Finally having had enough, Jintoki asks where then he belongs, as he grows frustrated. He threatens to mark his spots, but Kagura and Shinpachi kick him out. While Jintoki, Shinpachi, and Kagura are at Snack Smile, a lady tells them she was hoping they would have made a lot of money to pay off their rent, but it seemed like two years passed while they were sitting around, picking their nose. Jintoki, dejected, says he'll let Shinpachi, the new CEO, pay the rent. However, Shinpachi isn't pleased. He accuses Jintoki of pushing the responsibility on him whenever things aren't going well. He mockingly tells them to leave the responsibility to him, the new leader of Odd Jobs. Kagura says she'll help Jintoki in picking his nose, while Shinpachi is allowed to do the rest, but this doesn't sit well with Shinpachi, who yells at her to do something else, other than picking the nose. The lady admits she's disappointed. Every time she thinks Shinpachi and Kagura have changed, they simply return to their old ways. An old lady says she believes their poor behavior is being influenced by Jintoki's laziness, since it's popularly said that one bad apple can spoil the barrel. Jintoki says he'll rather be one of those sweet canned apples, than one in a barrel, implying that he'll rather be considered responsible for no one but himself. A customer agrees with him on this, that if he were alone he couldn't influence anyone. Tired, Jintoki asks that they stop accusing him of being a bad apple. Shinpachi asks why no one has bothered to ask them why they came back here. Kagura recalls when her brother, Umibozu, asked her if she knows why he continues to come back to see her. She jokingly tells him it's because he's bald, but he disagrees. He tells her he keeps on coming back because he has no particular reason, as he doesn't need a reason to see his family. Furthermore, he lets her know she doesn't need a reason to remain at odd jobs. She can stay just because she wants to. Back at Snack Smile, Shinpachi tells the lady that Umibozu looked a bit sad as he left with those words, but the lady isn't so concerned. She tells them she won't complain as long as they pay for their rent. On TV, Princess Soyo talks to the press about rebuilding the terminal. She says it's going just well, that regardless of how many obstacles they have to face, as long as they don't give up, they would get back up as many times as it takes. Abruptly, she's interrupted by a reporter, who asks about the assassination of former Prime Minister, Donald Zuram. Another reporter accuses her of masterminding the plot, according to rumors. Princess Soyo is caught off guard and left speechless, but then just in time, Nobium appears and asks them if they're ready to be eliminated for believing the princess to be the sort of person to eliminate those in her way. Out of the blue, a man shouts from a rooftop, that Zuramp was too great to be eliminated by girls. He believes Zuramp is still alive and watches over their nation as a heroic spirit. He threatens to punish the princess if she strays from the right path, declaring himself as the heroic patriot Obazi. Having had enough, Jintoki switches the TV off. He believes that since Katsura passed away, heroes no longer mattered. 
Shinpachi is furious at him for saying something he's unsure of. He believes the strange man on TV might be Katsura. Jintoki isn't having it, arguing that Katsura was probably brain dead. Jintoki accuses Shinpachi of being overly descriptive to Tama about what happened after the battle. He thinks it should be brief and nonchalantly takes over the narration, saying everyone passed away after the battle. Shinpachi cuts him off quickly and blames him for taking the easy way out. He considers it a lazy narration. Kagura interferes in their conversation in support of Shinpachi. She supposes it's only right to tell Tara what happened while she wasn't around, as well as the emotions they felt. Unexpectedly, heroic patriot Obazi sneaks into the diner, but gets headbutted by Kagura. Shinpachi tells Jintoki to stop trying to force an ending. Shinpachi proceeds with the narration to Tama. He says the Zuramp administration handed things over to the next generation, and with that, the Shinsengumi returned to power. Shinpachi playfully adds that Kondo continues to chase after Odi, Shinpachi's sister. Shinpachi, Jintoki, and Kagura struggle to find a good ending for their narration, as they meet the Shinsengumi during their celebration. Jintoki receives a letter from Tatsuma Sakamoto. He says they haven't talked in a while and asks how he's been. He tells him he's been flying across the universe, as always, and wishes Jintoki would come to join him. He says he's writing to him because he promised to rescue them all, but when he saw the terminal crumble down he assumed they were long gone. He adds that he's not trying to make a consolation, but he believes Shoyo saved them, and he, Jintoki, should stop blaming himself, for his teacher's soul living everywhere on earth and continues to watch over them. Before ending the letter, he informs him that he met Katsura, much to Jintoki's dismay, and heard about the remnants of the Kihaitai making strange moves. Lastly, he says Matako has been scouring the lands for ley lines, as she can't stand being so powerless. Upset by the letter, Jintoki rips it apart. Matako continues in her search for the ley lines and gets led to a baby that has emerged from one of the holes. Enchanted and emotional, she picks him up, tearful. Tama hurries to where the odd jobs used to be, but finds the spot empty, as everywhere has been replaced by futuristic buildings. Disappointed, she leaves. Hasegawa tells her machines have taken over the world and humans are mostly unemployed, like him. Realizing her memories must have been tampered with, Tamako warns Tama not to believe Hasegawa, nor the other things they saw prior, and just then, Jintoki, Kagura, and Shinpachi playfully attack Hasegawa for messing with their narration, and the illusion around Tama and Tamako promptly shatters, as a result. The odd jobs are still around and Jintoki tells Tama to wipe her tears away. Jintoki, Shinpachi, and Kagura rush off to an urgent job, but have apparently forgotten what the task is supposed to be. Whatever it is though, they will get it done, after all, they're the odd jobs.